Good afternoon, everyone. This is Caitlin from TechServe Alliance, and welcome to today's webinar, Messages that Inspire Clients and Candidates to Respond. There will be a question and answer session after the presentation, so feel free to write in any questions you want answered in the question box on the right side of your screen. We are also recording today's presentation, which will be available to TechServe members on the TechServe Alliance website and will be sent out in follow-up emails. Um, and then I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Barbruno. Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. And as usual, I love to be here to speak to the TechServe Alliance group. And I think today's message is very important because we're talking about messaging. So what kind of messages inspire clients and candidates to respond? Um, I just got back from another national conference and I've done a lot of state events. And over and over again, all I'm hearing from everybody is nobody answers messages. You know, emails are not being opened, voicemails are not being returned, and even in mail, they're linked are not being acknowledged. And so what do we do to improve messaging? According to LinkedIn, by 2030, the global um, shortage of talent could reach 85 million people, costing companies trillions of dollars in lost economic opportunities. And you don't want, you don't want that to represent who you are, and you don't want that to be you, which is why you've got to prepare now and change your messaging. Technology has changed the way we do business, and that includes the way we do messaging. It's so easy for clients and candidates to hide behind technology, especially when they're being bombarded with calls from recruiters and account executives. So why should they reach back out to you? Candidates and clients find it very simple to delete email, ignore voicemail, and avoid LinkedIn and messaging. And I think most of you know, I do a call for job seekers once a week. And I have anywhere from 1,800 to 2,500 job seekers on the call. And many of them are IT professionals, they're engineering professionals. And I do these calls once a week. And I am telling you that I hear, you know, I hear complaints from candidates all the time. They don't know I own a staffing firm. And so it's interesting because I'm going to share with you some of the pet peeves that I'm hearing from them because this is right from the mouths of the people that you and I represent. Clients. Clients tell me all the time, because I also speak in front of corporate audiences, that their biggest pet peeve is they can't stand when they run a job board ad, and then on Monday morning, they receive calls from 20 recruiters. I've even had people tell me that they literally write down the names of the recruiters that call them after they run a job board ad, and they won't do business with them. Because their feeling is, I just spent thousands of dollars on a job board ad. I want to see my results first. They also think that you and I are all alike. And they wish we had contacted them, you know, um, to basically call them before they ever ran a job board ad and told them why we targeted them as somebody we wanted to do business with, not that when they run a job board ad, we call them. And I was recently at a big corporate event in uh, Seattle, Washington. And what they said to me was, Barbara, that's just a sign of a lazy recruiter that we run a job board ad so they know we're looking and they call us. And then even more ironically, they send us the exact same people we got from the job board ad. And so if we're gonna hire a staffing firm, we don't want them to send us the same people we're surfacing on our own through the job board ads. Aren't you guys recruiters? You know, aren't you out there? Aren't you building a network of candidates that we don't have access to? You know, so these are, you know, they, they and again, calling after job board ads is number one pet peeve. Candidates, they're sick and tired of us presenting an opportunity before we know what's important to them. Candidates feel that you and I only represent the clients and that we don't care a bit about them. That, and this is their impression, and I hear this almost every week, that what do recruiters do? They get a job in and they have a list in front of them and they just call as many people as they have to call till somebody says yes. And what they're saying is that we don't care what's important to them. We're presenting a job that they would never, you know, they would never consider. We expect them to talk during the day when they can't talk, especially IT people. You know, they don't have a private cubicle. They're not in an office. They're usually in an open area with people right around them. And so they go, not only are you pitching a job I would never be interested in, you're trying to talk to me on my job with my coworkers next to me and my boss two feet away. You know, and so again, they can't stand this. So let's discuss how you communicate. You've got to use all means of communication, not only emailing and texting. Both clients and candidates will talk to you for one reason and one reason only, if they see, think they'll benefit by the conversation, if they don't think they're going to benefit, and if they put you into the group, you know, you people, if you sound like every other you people that calls them, 
they will not return the calls. They will not answer your emails. They won't answer your voicemails. Um, they, they will just ignore you. So what are the messages you have to leave? Let's start with your voicemail. One of the greatest frustrations in our profession is the ability to get anybody on the phone. You know, they've learned how to hide behind technology and they do ignore most of yours and my incoming calls. And so you have to leave a voicemail. But it's not easy to differentiate yourself on voicemail. It just isn't. So how do you get prospects to call you back? Most account executives and recruiters have reported an average of less than 5% of voicemails that are returned. Too many voicemails could be interpreted as the following. And I know this is not what you're saying, but this is what they're hearing. Hello, I'm a salesperson. I want to sell you something. Call me back. Now, this script that I have in front of you has a very high percentage of return phone calls. Now, I just got back from another national conference late Tuesday night, and it was interesting because, again, I was asking people in the audience, give me the voicemails you're leaving. Give me the voicemails that, that, that you're leaving right now, and how many of your voicemails are returned. And as a whole, and there are quite a few people there, it's, it's less than 5%. But think about this, when you get home from work, if you've got calls from salespeople, how many of those calls do you return? And I love when I get a call from somebody that's selling something that I absolutely would not be interested in. That's how candidates feel when you're talking about a specific job. Or you say, I saw your LinkedIn profile and I have a job that, that I feel is your next career move, would love to talk to you. And they're saying, you know, the funny thing is, Barb, I wanna change what I'm doing. I don't like what I'm doing now. It's like all you people assume that what we're doing or what's on our LinkedIn profile is what we want to do next. And half the time, we haven't even updated our LinkedIn profile. So our LinkedIn profile doesn't necessarily give an accurate accounting of what we do. And why do you assume that what I'm doing is what I want to do next? And again, that's why those calls don't work. There's no perfect, there's no perfect e uh, voicemail. But all I'm telling you is this is the voicemail that we leave and it has a very high percentage of callbacks. My top producer clients, and I've got thousands of people that take our course, they're using this voicemail. And no, do they get 100% callback? No, they don't. But they most certainly don't get 5% callback. You know, the lowest I've heard at the last conference I was at, I point blank asked people, those of you that are using my script, what's your callback percentage? And the average was anywhere between 40 and 50% callback. Well, that's a, that's a great, you know, that's a great um, jump from the normal 5%. So my voicemail is simple. Hi, my name is Barb Bruno. Someone suggested we talk. Do me a favor. When you call me back, tell whoever answers the line to interrupt me, no matter what I'm doing, I don't want to miss your call. Again, it's Barb Bruno. I leave my phone number. Have a great day. Looking forward to the conversation. Have a great day. Thanks. And so what I want to ask you is, why do you think that that voicemail is returned? Okay, it's returned for several reasons. You made the person feel important by telling them to interrupt you. OK, I said I didn't say, please call me back. I didn't pitch a job. I didn't give the name of my company. I didn't tell them what I do. I merely said someone suggested that we talk when you call me back. Please interrupt me. So I didn't say, please call me back. I hope you call me back. I said, when you call me back, please interrupt me. I, and I don't want to miss your call. You know, and so, you know, just interrupt me. Tell whoever answers the line. I don't want you to end up in my voicemail. I'm making the person feel important. I also sounded interested in talking to them, didn't I? Really looking forward to the conversation. Have a great day, thanks. Friendly, fun, you know, too often when we're leaving voicemails, we're flustered because people aren't answering their phone. And so our voicemails are kind of curt. They're not showing our personality or we sound bored like, oh God, another voicemail that they're not gonna return, you know? And, and we almost expect not to have voicemails return. But if you bring your personality to work, you sound friendly, you sound fun, you sound interested, you sound passionate, okay? that's when people return your phone call. A lot of it is your voice. You know, the curiosity, they want to know who told you to call them back. And you didn't sound like a salesperson. I'm not pitching anything. I'm not pitching anybody. I'm, I'm just saying, someone suggested we talk. Do me a favor, when you call me back, I don't want to miss your call. So please tell whoever answers the line to interrupt me, no matter what I'm doing. Again, my name is, my number is. Um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Have a great day, thanks. It's just a total different kind of phone call. Now, what happens when they say, who suggested we talk? I get that question always second when I'm doing this at conferences. If I ask everyone I interview when they, where they prefer to work and why, and your name continues to come up, I represent the best talent, but also want to represent the best companies. Let me share with you why top talent want to work for you. 
That would be on the client side. Because by the way, I leave this voicemail for clients. I leave the exact same voicemail for prospective candidates. So whether we're doing marketing or we're doing recruiting, we leave the same voicemail. And so if, if somebody said, who suggested we talk and you say, I ask everybody I interview, where do you want to work and why? And your name keeps coming up. And let me tell you why people want to work for you. You know, I represent the best talent, but as a result, I also need to represent the best companies. And I've determined that that's you. And let me explain why people want to work for you. You're giving them information that doesn't, it's not a cold call. It's not a pitch. You're telling them why people want to work for them. You're making them feel good about themselves. And that type of phone call has a much quicker response because you're making the person feel good about themselves. If a specific, ref if a specific person referred the client, I'm going to share the name. I could say I spoke to one of your past employees, and when they told me I'm going to say what this past employee said, I was inspired to call you. This brings up another point. This brings up another point that sales and recruiting have to work really close together because recruiters get inside information all the time on people you're trying to call on the sales side. They know exactly where their candidates want to work and why. They know, you know what jobs they've left that they regretted leaving. Those are all sales leads for you. And so, you know, recruiting and sales, you've got to work together. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to reach the goals, salespeople, quite frankly, you could write a ton of business, but if none of the contracts you write are filled, then you could lose your job. You're very dependent on the, the recruiters to fill those positions. But if you bring in a job that I don't understand at all, I don't understand the technology, I've never done it before, my chances of filling that are so slim. So look at where you're successfully filling jobs and write more of the same types of direct orders and contracts because then your recruiters are gonna be able to fill them faster. After hearing about your conference, at, a, at your, your company at a conference, I targeted you as someone I would love to represent and you tell them why. So anytime a prospective client asks, who suggested we talk, those are some of your answers. Now, what about a candidate who asks, who suggested we talk? I'm representing the person who referred you in a confidential search. And if I would ever have the opportunity to represent you too, I would give you that same level of confidentiality. Or we ask everyone who was the best, and then I put in a job title, at your last place of employment. So we're actually referred to you by a past coworker. And by the way, those of you that are recruiters on this line, you've got to add those six words every time you're talking to somebody from your last place of employment. If you want to double and triple the amount of candidates you're referred to, don't ask who's looking, don't ask who's qualified, say who was the best, you know, .NET developer at your last place of employment. Who was the best project manager at your last place of employment? Who was the best mechanical engineer at your last place of employment? That prevents them from saying, I don't know anybody. Okay, so you want to, you want to um, let them know, you know, that that it was a coworker. You asked who was the best person, and they're the ones that that suggested your name. So now it makes the person feel good about themselves. If a specific person referred the candidate, of course you're going to use their name. And if you've been in this business longer than two years, 40% of your new clients and 40% of your candidates should be referrals. So if that's not the case, you know, we're out there trying to message to, to new people all the time, but a lot of your calls that you should be getting, incoming calls, should be referrals that make, whether you're an account executive or recruiter, makes your job a lot easier. You also want to ask questions to determine their current needs or problems. And then, you know, situate yourself as a logical solution. You've only got a few seconds to make a great first impression. And so you want to make sure that you're asking questions on what's important to them. We've got to quit making what we do calls. They don't care about what you and I do. We do this, we do that, we do this. The candidates don't care what the clients need. The clients really don't care what the candidates need. All they care about is themselves. What's in it for me? The clients want to know you're going to give them candidates that make them look good. And not only are they going to show up for work, but they're going to work out the whole contract and they're going to be an engaged employee. The candidates, on the other hand, want to know that the contract they're going to take from you is going to enhance their resume so they can get more money down the road. It's going to teach them something new, and it's their next logical career move. Too often, candidates feel that we're trying to encourage them to take a lateral move, maybe a little bit more money, but they're not learning anything. Never forget about how important it is for these candidates to learn new things. You know, They want to enhance that resume so the next contract, they can earn more money. Let's talk about email. Okay, most emails are not open. The, the sender's name and subject line of your emails are the most important factors in having your email open and read. Individuals are likely to read your email because of who it's from, and almost 50% of emails that are open are based on the subject line. 
And so if you're a subject line, and you never want a subject line to have the, the, the letters FW, like you're forwarding it to more than one person. The subject line has to be compelling. So do you send your email using your company name or your name? This can make a huge impact on your open rate. Big data has proved that using your name rather than a general email address or company name can increase your open rate by almost 33%. What's wonderful is I've done 14 courses for LinkedIn Learning and I'm gonna do two more courses. And by the way, everybody, um, LinkedIn Learning let me release a free course this morning. I've done 16 courses for them and they let me release recruiting fundamentals. They called us late yesterday and for one day, all day today, for 24 hours from seven o'clock this morning till seven o'clock tomorrow morning, um, I they get they let us release recruiting fundamentals, which is the first course I did for LinkedIn two years ago. But it's a great course if you want some additional training for your recruiters, because you're a TechServe Alliance member, I'm giving you this information. Connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you connect with me on LinkedIn, go to my feed and you can click on and you can get that free course. And so I want to you know, put that out to all of the TechServe Alliance members. And they just told us about it you know, this morning. And they do this every so often, like once or twice a year, they'll let me release one of my full courses free and they did it this morning. So if you want some additional training, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn and then I'll, I'll accept, I'm accepting everybody's invitation today. And then you can you go on my newsfeed and you can take another free course or offer it to your people as one of the benefits of belonging to TechServe Alliance. So I want to throw that out because I just happened today. But if you use your name and a good subject line, you'll have a 33% more open rate. Most business emails are sent from a company name. And again, you know, you can gain a competitive edge by using your name versus a company name. When it comes to subject lines, have you heard the phrase, you could spend as much time writing your headline as you spend on writing the content? Well, the exact phrase applies to your email signature lines. A well-crafted subject line should be between six to 10 words. Think about when you're going through your emails. I don't know about you, but I get hundreds of emails every day. And I actually have somebody else opening. I have two or three different email addresses. I've got a separate email for clients. I've got a separate email that's just general things. And I don't do that email because I get too many. But it's interesting. It's a subject line. I mean, I'm very guilty when I'm going through email of going, you know, delete, 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 delete. And it's based on the subject line or who I get it from. So I'm sure you do the same thing. So what prevents people from deleting your email? These guidelines will help you um, basically improve the open rate of your email. Your open rate is something you need to track also because you want to consistently improve your open rate. And you can't do that unless you're tracking your open rate. And so you've got to watch. Sometimes you think I'm blasting this and nobody's answering me. It's because your emails are ending up in junk or the subject line is not compelling. And it's not that your email is not compelling. It's that nobody's opening it. So the open rate is one of the most important things for you to track. I used a subject line in um, 2019 that was so different from anything I had ever done. And my team thought I was crazy. I used the subject line, worst advice I ever got. Because when I went on Google and said, subject lines that are open most, in 2018, the worst advice I ever got was the number one opened email. And my team here was like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And how are you gonna tie that into what you're doing? And I said, I'll figure out how to tie it into it, but let's just try it. It was our highest open rate this year. A, a silly subject line that said, worst advice I ever got. Um, and I thought, why did people open that? I mean, I can't explain why they opened it, but if you wanna know compelling subject lines, go to Google and say, what were the subject lines with the highest open rate? And they'll give you a list of like 10 of them. See if you can use any of those in your business. You know, why try to reinvent the wheel when when other people have tracked this and they realize they had a high open rate. Now, how do you improve the res response rate to your LinkedIn in mail? And I can tell you that people are, you know, something like almost 80% of all email are not open. LinkedIn is concerned about their in mail because a lot of in mail are not being open. And of course, you spend extra money to get, you know, extra in mail. And so, of course, LinkedIn is really studying this because they want, you know, more in mail open. So, I'm going to give you some tips on how to get more in mail open. Write in mail subject lines that are concise, personal, and interesting. You know, don't neglect your subject line because the subject line matters. Most candidates will not read your entire in mail, but almost all of them read the subject line. If it's well written, they often, you know, often keep reading. Um, our, our talent blog categorized in mail subject lines into keepers, sleepers, and bleepers. Um, the keepers are personal, they're specific. The person realizes that you're not sending this out to everybody. 
like you're actually personalizing. They feel like you know something about them. The sleepers often bore candidates with generic, snoozeworthy subject lines, so they're not going to open it. And bleepers are just annoying and rude. You know, I love when someone connects with me on LinkedIn, and the minute we connect, I get a sales pitch from them. Or even when they're asking me to connect, they're trying to sell me on what they're doing. I don't connect with those people because that's not proper protocol on LinkedIn. You know, you're supposed to connect, make the other person feel great, find out what's important to them. And the, the goal of LinkedIn is to take them offline. You know, you want to you want to get the in-mail answered, but the goal of all your connections on in on LinkedIn is to have conversations offline. Number two, you've got to research your candidate and personalize as much as possible. If you want to grab somebody's attention, make a real connection. You know, candidates hate when they feel you're sending out bulk email. You know, when you refer to like connections or groups, you know, you should belong to a number of groups. If you don't belong to 20 groups, that's something you have to work on. You've got to belong to the groups that your clients and your candidates belong to. When you refer to like connections or groups that you both belong to and you have something in common um, or the skills you noticed on their profile, even if I go, to, I go to hobbies and I go to everything because if somebody is a golfer, you know, and there's a golf tournament going on, I'm going to talk about that. If somebody loves football, I'm going to talk about whatever games went on this week. You know, it, it's interesting because if you can talk about something they like, then all of a sudden they like you more, let them talk about themselves, they like you more, and they'll reach out to you because you've taken the time to learn about them. Send email throughout your day. Uh, when I'm asking recruiters, why are you sending in mail when you should be reaching out to people by the phone? You know, why are you spending all your prime time sending in mail? They go, that's the only time that people will answer is if you send out, you know, between 9 and 11.30 and 1.30 and 4. I can tell you I've got access to LinkedIn's big data. I'm part of the LinkedIn Insider Group. We meet once a month. There's there's a handful of us that are in this group and they're sharing big data and we can ask them questions. And this was one of my questions. Is there a time of the day where in-mail are open? Is there a sweet spot? Certain times when people you know, open in-mail and LinkedIn's data has proven that there is no sweet spot or preferred time of the day. People open in-mail when they decide to open in-mail. So don't convince yourself that during prime time hours when you should be talking to people that that's the best time to send in-mail because their big data has proven that's not true. You know, you could send in mail at the eat during evening hours. And a lot of times people are on their LinkedIn profile or they're, they're doing things online at night. Sometimes that's a better time. And, you know, they reach back out to you and you might even be able to get a conversation going with them because they're not at work. Number four, you've got to keep your in mail short. Again, and you see the word personalized again? Um, this is going to help you receive the most responses. Remember, LinkedIn is working in the background to give you an extra boost. You know, they're doing everything they want. You know, their new improved in-mail analytics report helps you easily track your performance at a glance and obtain personalized insight on how to improve your rate of response even more. LinkedIn wants your in-mails to work because, of course, they want you to keep utilizing their resources. So they're in the background trying to give you as much boost as you can. But again, they can't write your subject lines. They can't personalize it. If your messages are about what you do, what you want, or what you need, or what your hiring authorities need, chances are going to be ghosted. You know, we always kind of point our finger at the other person. It's their bad behavior, why they're not getting back to us, when in essence, they don't see how they can benefit. If the bottom line is, if your voicemail, email, and in-mail and texting, if they understand how you can benefit them, they're going to be more responsive. Too often, they just feel we're pitching. They'll buy, but they don't want to be sold. There's a big difference in buying and being sold. Your LinkedIn profile should sell you. It should sell you, okay? You can't just have one little title under your name. You know, you want to have different things that you do to make you interesting. There was an individual that I recently did some consulting for, and it was funny because his last name was King, okay? So his last name was King. And so, you know, a lot of his clients call him by his last name, hey, King, you know, and when I went in his LinkedIn profile, he had down um, recruiter and account executive as his title. And I said, are you only placing people in the cloud? And he said, I am. I said, then put your title down as king of the cloud. Your last name is king. You know, you only place positions in the cloud. Get known as the king of the cloud. You could have so much fun with that. And I told him this probably six months ago, and I keep getting little messages from him on how much fun he's having with that. Show your personality in your LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn profile has to be a mini sales letter, not telling me about, you know, I don't want it, I don't want it to be your resume. Make sure, now these are things that I got from LinkedIn. This is what LinkedIn gave me 
um, when I said, okay, what is the perfect LinkedIn profile? What should you do? And this is the guidance. Your photo should be a professional headshot. The headline should be 20 characters and should be keyword rich, not just your job title. What words would your candidates search if they're looking for someone like you? What words would your clients search if they're looking for somebody, they need talent? Your profile, you need to edit your background. You can edit your background at no charge now. That used to be an, an extra cost at the top of the page. And if you don't know how to do that, go to Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. Fiverr are thousands of people that'll do work for you for $5. And it's amazing the quality of work because they're hoping you come back to them and you'll give them more work or maybe pay them more for other things. But if you don't know how to edit your background, just go to Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R, -R, and they can edit your background and personalize it. Your summary should be limited to 2,000 characters. And what you want to do is validate your expertise. My, my suggestion has always been, Prepare this in a Word document and then copy and paste it in your summary. First person is key. You know, you want to talk in the first person and only talk about yourself in the first couple of lines and then talk about who you help and, you know, what's in it for them if they reach out to you and what do you want them to do? What is the call to action? You know, you want to use bullet points. You want to use links to your website to sign up. You want to add media, YouTube videos, add keywords to your description. You know, you've always got to think about what do people type in on a Google search if they're looking for a recruiter or they're looking for someone when they want to hire, they want a recruiter to help them find top talent. What are the keywords? Because your, your LinkedIn profile has to be keyword rich, okay? Um, your experience is 2,000 characters. This is not a copy of your resume or your CV. Again, this is a mini sales layer. Reiterate what you do for who. What is the call to action? You know, if you have different lines of business, separate them out. If your firm does contract as well as direct, you've got to separate that out so you're not confusing people that are looking at your LinkedIn profile. If somebody gets confused, a buyer that's confused and has too many options doesn't buy. So it's got to be really clear if you do more than one thing. Your skills, you, should, you can list up to 50 skills, 80 characters. Endorsements, only have endorsements that people that endorse your top 10 skills. Keyword phrases or areas of expertise. So if I asked you, what are the top 10 things you want to be uh, recommended for because so often people recommend you but they just don't say enough about you are they saying you know I, I'm recommending you because the last five people I hired from you are still here two years later you do a great job or the candidates you place are more engaged than any other candidates I hire or you are so fast like what do you want to be known for that the people you place you know continue work out their contract they're retained that you place people that are above everybody else's that they're very engaged you know, are you faster than, than other recruiting firms or account executives at filling needs? You know, when you stop and think of skills, you've got to think of the 10 things you want to be known for. And, and again, think of the keywords people are searching, and that's what you put in your skills. Interests, something about you. And, and for a while, I didn't even put down interests, but I'm telling you, these are triggers because it's common interests. If somebody's a golfer and you're a golfer, you know, if I'm talking to a baseball fan, I'm a baseball fan. If I'm talking to Someone who is a golfer, I, you know, I golf that day, tease them that I flog, which is golf spelled backwards, which is sort of describes my game. And then they think that's funny. They think it's funny. Um, bonus tip. You want to do the shift F3 at the top and put in keywords and LinkedIn will highlight the use of the words in the profile. So once you get your profile done, hit shift F3 in the bar at the top and then put in keywords that you know people are going to use to look for someone like you. And then LinkedIn's going to highlight the words that you used in your profile. And if you haven't used keywords enough, now you got to go back in and you got to add the keywords in. So obviously think about keywords before you even go back and revise your LinkedIn profile. What words are people using to search an account executive, to search a recruiter, to find a recruiting firm? And then settings. You definitely need to uncheck the box that is the shared viewers of this profile also viewed. Because you and I both know that that's showing them your competitors. Why would you want them to see where, you know, other, other resources the companies are looking at or other recruiters that candidates are using? So make sure you uncheck the box. You don't want to share the viewers of your profile. You don't want to show them who these people also view. And this is extremely important. I, I want to tell you that whether I'm in front of corporate audiences, and I think most of you know that 50% of my speaking now is in front of corporate audiences because I'm trying to teach them how to use us. The rest of it is staffing and recruiting, but I also do those calls for job seekers once a week. And when I'm talking to hiring authorities and I ask them, do you go to LinkedIn and check out a recruiter? They go, always. 
And we want to see on their profile if they're helping other companies like us. We want to see if they really specialize in what it is that we need. We want to see their commitment, you know, to the recruiting profession. You know, we want to know that, that they know our world. The candidates, the same thing. Half the time when you've got somebody on the phone and they hear your name, they've already got you pulled up. IT people are, are more technical than just about anybody else. And so they absolutely are going to look at your LinkedIn profile. And what they're going to do, they, they instantly go to recommendations to see if, 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 you, if, if, a, if I'm a mechanical engineer or project manager, I want to go to your LinkedIn profile and I want to see recommendations from other project managers just like me. Because now I know you've been successful in hiring people just like me. So sometimes you're either being screened in or screened out before you ever utter a word to somebody because they're using your LinkedIn profile as their first phone call back. And so sometimes they go to your LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn profile either encourages people to call you like, wow, look at this person. I want to work with them. Or, yeah, they don't do what I do. I'm not calling it back. And I can tell you, at the last technology conference I attended, I said, how many of you check, check out a LinkedIn profile of a recruiter you're going to work with? Almost every hand went up. Um, I just got back from a CEO conference. And I asked CEOs, how many of you check out resources before they call you back? It was about half. And then the other half admitted, well, we have HR do that. You know, we don't do it, but we want to make sure we have HR check out everybody to make sure that they're a good resource before we'd ever, ever reach out. So often, you know, the reason your calls are being screened out, it's not that you're being ignored. They weren't impressed by your LinkedIn profile. That's how important it is. That's how important it is. So as a result of this call, you know, I'm hoping that you're going to do different subject lines. I hope you change your voicemail. I hope you realize that in-mail can be answered if you do them a little unique. But more important than anything else, you've got to upgrade your LinkedIn profile. You know, if you look at your LinkedIn profile and it's boring and it reads like a resume, you know, and it's not a mini sales letter, it doesn't excite you, then it's not going to excite the people that go there. You know, reading about you is not half as great as talking to you or meeting you. But again, people are using that as a screening tool. And by all means, think of the keywords on your LinkedIn profile before you even go to your LinkedIn profile. Write down the keywords that your clients would search if they needed to find a staffing firm because they want to hire contractors or employees. Think of the words that they would search in Google or any place else. And then if you're a recruiter, go on the candidate side. What are the words that your candidates would look for if they were going to search for a recruiter? And write those keywords down. And the first thing you should do on your current profile is hit that F3 key, put those keywords in and see how weak your current profile is. Because again, it's got to be keyword rich because you're trying to show the person that is, is viewing this profile that you're the person that they should utilize. Okay, and before I get to questions, I want to get to a couple other slides first that I think are really, really important because the TechServe conference is coming up on November 5th to 7th. And I can tell you that the TechServe conference is by far my favorite conference. I've been the chairman of the board of other associations. And I still say that the TechServe conference is my favorite conference and it is because I've never seen an event where you can walk out with connections that will make you money within a very short period of time. There's something different about attending an event and just attending webinars. I have a lot of you, in fact, it was interesting, when I go out there and I'm training, I'll have people come up and say, gee, I heard, I, I went to your, you know, some of the TSA webinars that you do for TSA, and I go, that's awesome. And they go, but I really wanted to hear you in person. I really wanted to come to an event. If you haven't signed up yet, there's time. You know, this is in November 5th to 7th. I could tell you the location that they're going to is wonderful, but more importantly than that, more importantly than that is the content. TechServe Alliance listens to you. You know, you're going to have information on building and retaining a strong team. You're going to you're going to get specific ideas, new ideas on how to find those candidates, the IT and engineering talent. There's sales, business development, marketplace differentiators at the conference, executive leadership and management. And that's not even mentioning, I think one of the greatest things about the TechServe conference is they take networking to a whole new level. You know, and I think the people that attend the conference are always kind of a cut above. They're always the firms that are doing decent, you know, and, and they're coming out there and because they want to always get to know more. But these are also the people that'll share ideas. You know, I see some of the most successful firms in the country interacting with other successful firms to see if there's anything that they want to add on. There's nothing better than that in-person experience. We're talking about messaging today. And my message to you is if you're on the fence or you haven't signed up yet, you know, I would really, really strongly recommend 
that you attend the TechSurf conference. It's, it's something that is worth your time. And I know it's on the West Coast this time. And I'm in Chicago, so I'm lucky, you know. Um, and yet the West Coast is a, a little bit longer flight than, say, Florida. But if I'm on the East Coast, I might be going, well, do I wait till next year when it might be closer to me? I'm telling you, during the flight, you can get some work done when nobody can interrupt you. You're still connected on all flights. So you've got some private time to get things done. And I'm telling you, it's worth the trip. I'm sure when you take a vacation, you're not worried about how many hours you're spent flying. And so even though it's on the West Coast, at least the weather will be nice. Um, you know, and I'm telling you, the experience is well worth that, that three or four hour flight that you're gonna do. Um, there's still time to register. And you know, I, I talked to Susan this morning and I said, okay, we've got members on the phone. Can we offer members a special discount if they sign up now? And so they came up with a $200 discount. So if you sign up right now, um, you know, they've got a $200 discount and the discount code is recruiter, you know, but again, there is going to be such a phenomenal, a phenomenal conference this year that when I look at the program, I'm like, they just outdo themselves every year. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how TechServe ups the, ups the bar every single time, but I think it's because every year they do you know, great research. And what did you like? Where could we have improved? What are the new ideas? They're very connected to the membership. And I think that's why every year it just gets better and better. If you think you can't afford to attend Tech Service, Tech Serve, the conference, then I'm telling you, you're the person that can't afford not to. Because if you're sitting there going, God, can I, can I take the time away from my business? Can I take the time? Then if you're at that particular point in time, you will learn things that will come back and instantly make you money. And so please seriously consider this. You can learn more at www.techserveconference.org. Okay, obviously, um, just to name a few sessions, um, we're not in Kansas anymore, you know, motivating the recruiting team, how it's challenging. Take your sourcing skills to the next level. This workshop is designed for everybody who's looking, you know, for, for sourcers and recruiters and recruiting managers of firms. Anybody's encouraged to participate. This is not only for sourcing for sourcers. This is for everybody. The tech toolkit, this is a primer for enhanced communication, um, knowing how they think, what they say, how to understand their languages. Again, these are all things that TechServe at the end of every year asks you, what do you want to see at next year's conference? And that's how all these things are, you know, all these things are put on the program next year. I also, of course, have to promote certification. What I taught you this morning is just a small portion of what's in the TechServe certification program. And there's no better time to get certified than now. Um, I know, you know, a lot of you are looking. I think, I think that being educated, feeling that you're advancing your career is getting is very important. Even to the new, newer generations that are in, you know, entering our profession, education and enhancing your knowledge is is something that's very important to all of you. And it's great. Your candidates and clients have a lot of certifications behind their name, and so especially in IT, they really respect a certification more than I think any other niche out there. So if you're thinking about it, you know, wouldn't it be great if you committed to, you know, becoming certified before the end of the year? I will be at the TechSurf conference. I'm doing, you know, programs for them. If you've got any questions about certification uh, or you've got any questions about anything going on in your business, I make myself very accessible during the conference. But I can't tell you, when I look at this year's program, they've outdone themselves. The location is beautiful. The weather will be great, you know, and you're going to leave with ideas that you can back. If you're looking for how do I get a return on my investment? You know, um, I'm telling you, when you go to the Tech Serve Alliance conference, it's tenfold. You know, what you learn at the conference and the connections you make, there has never been a friendlier board of directors. I, I love how the board of directors make themselves very accessible during the event. You know, the, the Tech Serve Alliance team is there to help you. Any of us that are speaking, we're there to talk to you throughout the whole conference. And so seriously, look at those dates. You still have time to book cheap flights, um, and I don't care where you are in the country, um, you know, is it worth the investment? Yes, it is. All right, I'm done with my commercial. You can tell I really love the conference. And uh, when I saw that $200 discount, it made me very, very happy. And then my last gift to you is please connect with me on LinkedIn so I can give you that free course. And the only reason you're getting that free course is because I'm doing this, this webinar for TechServe and they just happened to release the course this morning. They do this like twice a year and they released it this morning at seven for 24 hours. And so if you want to, you know, give your people some free training, then connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll make sure that I accept it and that go to my feed and you'll click on and you'll have that free training for your people as a gift from me to the TechServe Alliance members. 
So Caitlin, uh, why don't we go to questions now? Let me see if I have any questions. You can ask me questions one of two ways. You can go to the control panel at the right. And when you called in, we gave you a telephone number, an access code and a PIN number. If you put all three numbers in, you can go to that little hand that looks like a raised hand in a circle and that control panel and I'll unmute the lines and you and I can talk or you can type in questions. Uh, see that question, uh, the gray bar toward the bottom. If you type in a question there, if you don't want me to use your first name, then then um, just put confidential or anonymous. If you uh, don't mind, I will use your first name if you don't do that. What do you say when they ask who suggested you connect with them? Um, I did give you like answers if it was a client or a candidate. If you look at your handout, the answers are in there. So I gave you four or five things that you can say for both clients and candidates. Um, from the big data from LinkedIn, when do people answer in-mails? They answer in-mails when they're personalized. They answer in-mails when they think it would um, it would benefit them to, to open, it, open it. So it has to be what's going to benefit your audience. Who is it that you place? Who is it that, you know, you've got to give them information that, that they're going to find valuable and only you know your audience. So, you know, they're going to answer in-mails if they see what's in it for them. What is considered a good open rate in LinkedIn in-mail according to the stats? Um, it's interesting. A good, a good open rate for, for in-mail is that you continually you continually increase your open rate okay so i literally asked that question like what do you consider a percentage like what would be a good a good open rate they said what people need to do is people need to look at what their current open rate is and then they need to keep changing the way they're doing things so that they continually increase it so don't say gee i need to have a 50 percent open rate or a 75 percent open rate um i know you know we have roughly a 60 percent open rate for in mail but again we're personalizing we're doing you know we're doing many different things to make sure that it's all about them and not about us. You know, so I think that it's really important. Somebody just asked what time of the day do people answer emails? It's all over the board. There's no perfect time to send them and there's no set time when people when people answer them. They do it all day long. And so, you know, it, it's interesting. Now somebody's asking me to share my LinkedIn profile link. And what I would say to you is um, send an email to support at staffingandrecruiting.com. That's an easy e email support at staffingandrecruiting.com and in the subject line just put down need linkedin profile link because the link's longer so that support email is easier that comes right to my support team so if you send them a support support at staffingandrecruiting.com they'll send you my linkedin link because it's longer and so we'll be glad to do that for you right away let's see um do you really see a big difference in conference learning versus online learning because attending a conference is more expensive. And I'm telling you, you get a return on your investment as there is a big difference. There's a big difference when you're in person. Even I can tell you from the viewpoint of a trainer and an owner. As a trainer, when I'm interacting with somebody face to face, I can read their body language. I can ask them follow up questions. I meet with people after sessions to help them and all those, all the trainers do. So, you know, from a vantage point, that's much better as an owner. Um, I always believed in sending my team to conferences. And the reason I do that is because they come back and they're just re-energized. And I always tell them, just come back with three ideas. You know, it, it do one new idea in the three months you're back from conference. And if your people just come back with three ideas and implement one every 21 days after they're back from the conference, you're going to have increased sales and profits. So absolutely, it's worth the investment. So yes, I do believe it's worth the investment from an owner standpoint and then from a trainer standpoint, I love to train face to face with people, you know, and I love when I'm interacting with people one on one because one question leads to another and everybody in the, in the room is learning. Plus, I'm telling you the amount of knowledge that is shared over a cocktail that is shared at the networking events. The owners of TechServe are some of the neatest people I've ever met. TechServe attracts a very high caliber of human being. The TechServe members are just just a cut above the normal. And these people go there and they're willing to share. And they're willing to, I mean, they're, you know, I've seen, I've seen such sharing of information that, that it just astounds me sometimes. And so, you know, if, you, if there's areas where you need improvement, this is the conference to attend. Because not only are you going to learn from the speakers, you're going to learn from the attendees. And even the board members, they're so willing to give. I go to the women's luncheon every year. And I can tell you that the things that the speakers share at the women's luncheon and how giving those women are, it, it amazes me. And it's not only the women of TechServe, but if you are a female in business, attend the women's luncheon um, because the, the camaraderie and the networking that goes on there is, is, and I don't know any other group 
that separates out the women leaders like that. And, um, and they've done that for years. And, and that's just another event where you're going to make some connections that can really enhance your career. Let's see, I see no more questions. Let me go back and see if anybody raised their hand. I'm not going to take it personally that none of you want to talk to me. Okay, no hands raised. Let's see. Is it professional to reach out to candidates after business hours? Absolutely. In fact, they prefer it, Susan. Um, when I'm at the technology conferences, they go, you know, if you call me at six, you've got me. I can't talk during the job. During the day, you get their cell phone number, and all you do is propose a, a discussion about their career and then have it after business hours. That's when they prefer to talk. This is not an eight to five job. The beauty about what you and I do is if we're working after hours, we're at home, we're on a smartphone. So you don't have to be in an office, you know? So yes, it's not only professional, many technology candidates prefer to talk after six, after they're home. They go, that shows us, you know, then you're not one of the you people. You're showing them that you're more dedicated and you're willing to talk to them after hours when they can talk more. Let me see if there's any hands being raised. Let me see if there's any more questions. I see no more questions. Kate Lynn, did you want to add anything or are there any more questions that need to be answered? I don't see any. I think that's uh, good, Barb. You know, I'll uh, just do a quick um, announcement uh, just to let everyone know that our next certification webinar will be on October 31st, very spooky. Um, and I believe that is titled uh, Effectively Increased Margins and Fees. So, you know, Important topic always. Um, registration for that will be uh, headed out in the uh, follow-up emails that you will receive as well for all registrants. So as always, um, if you don't think you'll be able to attend one of Barb's sessions live, um, I recommend that you register anyway so that you are sent the recording and the slides uh, directly to your email because it's sent out to all registrants. Um, beyond that, I think that is it for me, Barb. Um, you can also, of course, always reach out to the email address that's on the screen or to staff at techservereliance.org if you, you know, have any lingering questions about um, any of the content we covered, anything TechServe. So uh, with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. All right. I, I want to agree with you. I want to add one more thing, Caitlin. Any of sure, you, sure, sure. if your owner is not going to conference and you'd like to go to the conference, the conference is not only open to owners and managers. It's open to account executives and recruiters. And your owner doesn't have to pay your way. I mean, is this a great investment for you to make in yourself to go there and get the knowledge? And if I was an owner and one of my people came up to me and said, I would love to uh, you know, attend TechServe, can I have the time off? I'm gonna do it on my own dime. That would go so far with me as an owner. I'd be like, oh my God, how impressive is that? So if you're sitting there going, gee, I wish I could go to the conference, but my owner doesn't send us, there's nothing preventing you from investing in yourself. Just like certification, if your owner is not, you know, if, if your owner is not paying for certification, there's nothing preventing you from, from investing in yourself because again, you're gonna get the investment back too. So I would really, you know, like to say my last word to recruiters, account executives, I don't care what your title is, you know, you're all welcome at the conference and you're most certainly all welcome to participate in our certification program. So I hope you consider that as a possible investment in yourself as well. Fantastic, Barb. Thank you so much again. Um, and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Yes, have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye.